Tonight, inflation hits its lowest point in more than two years, but for many Canadians, it doesn't feel like it. Just affordability of life, honestly, like it's already a struggle for me. From housing to food, why we're still feeling the pinch. Could hearing aids reduce your risk of dementia? It's not just improving your hearing. The potential benefits. Lost at sea for months, a man and his dog survived. I'm alive and uh, I did, really didn't think I'd make it. Their incredible rescue story. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. And we begin tonight with breaking news here in Vancouver. That tentative deal to end a strike at British Columbia ports is off. That means once again some 30 ports are closed and the flow of goods in and out of the West Coast stalled as workers are back on the picket line. And that's where Renee Filipponi is tonight. Renee, just days ago we thought this was all over. What happened? Well, Ian, late this afternoon, we got word that the picket lines were going back up here and 7,400 port workers were off the job again. Now, according to the International Longshore Warehouse Union, something called the Longshore Caucus has rejected this tentative deal for two main reasons. The first, that they don't believe it protected the jobs now and in the future from contracting out and automation. And they also took issue with the wage increases when they compare it to the record profits that the companies are making. Now, the employer says the union has rejected what it called a fair and balanced deal. This was a deal put to them by the federal mediator last week. There was a 24-hour deadline on it from Ottawa to either reject or accept it. They accepted it. That ended the 13-day work stoppage. Five days ago, work got going back on the ports here, but not anymore. And Renee, what's the reaction been? Well, the union says they are ready to go back to the bargaining table and they'll stay here there as long as it takes. We've heard from businesses who say they're very disappointed. They say $500 million in trade is lost every day the ports are shut down and they're calling on Ottawa to legislate them back to work. Now, Ottawa at this point is not commenting on the ratification process. But keep in mind, this impacts 30 ports across BC, including Vancouver, Canada's busiest port. So for now, all that cargo is going to remain in the ports or in the harbor with nowhere to go. Ian? Renee Filipponi in the Port of Vancouver, thank you. Some promising economic news tonight from Stats Canada. The rate of inflation is continuing to head in the right direction. In June, inflation in this country hit 2.8%. That's the lowest it's been in more than two years. It's also within the Bank of Canada's desired range of 1% to 3%, though 2 is the true target. But while prices for many things are stabilizing, the overall cost of living is still sky high. Anis Hadari explains why. Living in a construction zone was already noisy. Now there's a financial headache. I was actually um, <clears throat> going to ask for lower rent and then when my um, next lease renewal came up they had actually increased it so I was less than happy about it. Nearly $400 more each month. Is this for real? I actually didn't believe it when I first got it. I had to like read it three times to make sure that what I was processing what I was reading. I actually was in shock. But not everything is getting more expensive. At 2.8%, inflation is actually at its lowest level in more than two years. Promotions have made internet and cell service cheaper, and gasoline down 21% compared to last year. But economists point out there are still big problems. The things that matter the most, unfortunately, like food and shelter costs, you know, rent costs and mortgage interest costs as well, those things are still seeing inflation at extremely elevated levels. Food is up more than 9%. Housing is seeing big jumps too. Not just rent, mortgages are up more than 30% as the Bank of Canada increases interest rates. A lot of households, unfortunately, are renewing their mortgages at double the payments than what they used to be paying. Um, and, you know, that renewal is going to hit a lot more households. That can cool off the economy slowly because those households may have less money to spend. So they upped your rent by like 400 bucks and it's been like this the whole time? But even without a mortgage, Steph Haynes feels it now. So those are the things I'm worried about. Rental increases, food going up even more, just affordability of life, honestly. Like it's already a struggle for me, so.
So, Anise, inflation is now within the Bank of Canada's 1% to 3% target, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to cut rates anytime soon. No, in fact, there are signals that those rates might increase again because certain types of inflation aren't down quite enough yet. You might hear it called core inflation, and that takes out things that fluctuate a lot. Think gasoline. But all of these interest rate increases will take some time to take hold in the economy anyway. You know, people don't all go out and renew their mortgages at once, for example. So as all of these things keep happening, people keep borrowing money, the changes to interest rates should result in more changes to inflation over time. And the Bank of Canada hopes those changes are in a downward direction. All right, Denise, thank you. As you heard, housing is one of the main factors influencing inflation. And when it comes to rent, there's growing evidence that the cost is not just beyond the reach of some people, it has been for a while. Kyle backs now with a Canada-wide problem that's getting worse. Sylvana Orlana is a single mom with a full-time job. But earning minimum wage, she's falling behind on paying rent. I'm currently in a one-bedroom in a den, and the den isn't that big, and that's where my baby sleeps. The bedroom isn't also that big. This is technically a basement, and I'm paying close to two grand for it. She isn't alone. A new report by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives highlights just how difficult it can be to find affordable housing. They looked at 800 neighbourhoods across Canada. A minimum wage earner could only afford a one-bedroom unit in 54 of them and a two-bedroom in just 21. They used data from last year, and rent has only gotten more expensive since. I'm concerned about minimum wage workers and these kinds of, of very risky situations. Uh, they must be putting themselves through it. The think tank says no one should pay more than 30% of their income on housing, a standard becoming more aspirational than a reality. It's quite disturbing that in Canada we have such an, uh, an extreme a uh, cost of living challenge for, for so many people. Wages are one problem. The short supply of apartments is another. The third, a lack of regulations on current rental properties. This expert says the crisis calls for rent subsidies. Consider rent geared to income. That's a way of ensuring that the low income Canadians can at least afford the rent that they do have to pay now. Orlana is falling behind on some bills, even as she relies on family for help, including her parents. Recently, they came up to me and they're like, listen, we love you, we love your son, like, we'll do anything to help you, but this is getting expensive and we can't pay our own bills at now. And this one's always fun. She would love to have more space, but she's focused now on making sure her current rent is always paid. <laughs> Kyle Bax, CBC News, Toronto. In the U.S., Donald Trump is staring down another serious legal challenge. The former president says he expects to be arrested and indicted by the January 6th inquiry, possibly within days, and all at a crucial moment in the presidential election cycle. Katie Simpson has the fallout. The violence unleashed on the U.S. Capitol. We fight like hell. The and crucial moments like leading up to the January 6th here. assault and the wider coordinated efforts to keep Donald Trump in power. All are part of the investigation, zeroing in on the former president. On social media, Trump said his lawyers got a letter from the Department of Justice Sunday, stating that I am a target of the January 6th grand jury investigation, which almost always means an arrest and indictment. At his first campaign rally after this revelation, Trump attacked the Department of Justice. We have prosecutors that are evil people. These are evil people. Deranged, I call him deranged, just one particular man. I think he's a sick person. Any comments on the target letter? The special counsel leading the investigation, Jack Smith, offered no comment as reporters shouted questions at him during his lunch break. That's absolute bullshit. Yeah, that's my reaction. Trump's defenders repeated his narrative. Any and all charges are politically motivated. President Trump went up in the polls and was uh, actually surpassing President Biden for re-election. So what do they do now? Weaponize government to go after their number one opponent. Trump has already been indicted twice this year in New York on financial charges related to alleged hush money payments to a porn star and in a separate federal investigation over his handling of classified documents after leaving office. His lawyers in that case are asking the judge to delay the trial until after the 2024 election. 
Though the legal drama isn't hurting Trump politically, he's got a commanding lead in the Republican nominee race. His closest competitor, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, was applauded for defending Trump at his own campaign rally by accusing Democrats of targeting his opponent. You don't have one side just constantly trying to put the other side in jail. And, and that, unfortunately, is, is uh, what we're seeing now. Katie, if there's going to be an indictment, when might that happen? Predictions range anywhere from the next few days to maybe, maybe the next couple of weeks. This is a complicated, wide-ranging investigation that's been underway for more than two years. No one else from Trump's inner circle has come forward to say they also received a target letter, at least not yet. And if it eventually does go to trial, it would take a long time to move through the court system, meaning efforts to overturn the last U.S. presidential election will loom large over the next presidential vote. Ian. Katie Simpson in Washington tonight. In southern Europe, people are living through an unrelenting heat wave made worse by raging wildfires. And as Abby Kugadassin shows us, this is only the start of a much hotter summer. From the Swiss Alps, rare scenes of wildfires. To the woodlands of Greece, the blazes are unrelenting as searing heat grips Europe. North of Athens, crews battle the flames from the air. A closer look on the ground shows it's not yet enough. She fights for a uh, whole life to have a house and uh, in a few minutes they are, they are nothing. This couple spent 32 years making a home together. Now it's gone. It's terrible, she says. It's like we're half dead. Elsewhere, as the flames move ever closer, a hymn sung by nuns showing their belief, but defiance too, with one refusing to leave despite this police officer's pleas. In many European cities, the temperatures are rising into the high 30s, even 40s during the day. And the setting sun doesn't bring much respite. Temperatures don't dip far enough uh, towards low temperatures at night. It's just the fact that human bodies need a break during the 24-hour cycle. More than 60,000 people died last summer in Europe due to record-shattering heat. The impacts of human-caused climate change already apparent. We really have the power to do something. It's a big challenge, of course. That's why uh, the international community has pledged um, to uh, go to net zero. So we know scientifically, again, that we need to do that by 2050 or so. Then there's El Nino, the naturally occurring weather pattern emerging for the first time in years. The recently declared El Nino is only expected to amplify the occurrence and intensity of extreme heat events. Any relief is temporary. Temperatures are not expected to drop because another heat wave is already moving in. The European Space Agency says next week the continent could see the hottest temperatures ever recorded. Abby Kouadas in CBC News, London. Here in Canada, BC's wildfire season is now the most destructive on record. More than 13,900 square kilometers of land has been burned so far this year, and hundreds of wildfires are still burning across the province. The military has been deployed to help, and on the coast, an aggressive fire has cut off highway access for the community of Bella Coola. Climate change doesn't just mean higher temperatures, it's likely to bring more humidity as well. But BC and Alberta don't factor in the humidex when issuing heat warnings. Jayla Bernstein explains why that could be dangerous. Working in the dry heat, nothing new for southern Alberta. But humid heat, that's rare. This time of year is probably the most humid it gets, which isn't very humid. That may change. Global warming threatens to bring more hot and humid weather to the west, disrupting industries like construction. Here in Montreal, people are used to Humidex. That's how warm it feels when heat and humidity mix. Too much humidity, and it's harder to cool off by sweating. It's a foreign concept for parts of BC and Alberta. It's just something they're not prepared for, and more people to be affected, um, and possibly more morbidity. Depending on greenhouse gas emissions, projections show Vancouver could see up to about 26 more high Humidex days by the end of the century. 
Edmonton could see 30 more, and Lethbridge, Alberta, could see an increase of 38 high humidex days. We're a resilient group here in southern Alberta, and uh, I think we will just have to make do. He says the construction industry can adapt, shifting work hours earlier or later. Farming, too, will have to adjust. I would make a lot of things just really challenging in terms of getting things done outside. So if we need to move cattle that day, we need to move cattle that day regardless of the temperature. Alberta and B.C. are the only provinces that don't trigger heat warnings based on Humidex alone. A concern for the city of Lethbridge, where people are already feeling the heat. This puts us in an awkward situation when we know things are happening in the community, but we're not meeting specific thresholds of a provincially uh, defined emergency. Uh, what we've done is by utilizing uh, the Municipal Government Act, we've actually found a way where we can define our own emergency. It's one local solution to new extremes, as Canada pledges to eliminate heat wave deaths by 2040. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. And you can get a Humidex projection for where you live. Head to this site and enter your postal code. Select the amount of greenhouse gas emissions anticipated, and it will give you historic and future projected trends. A U.S. soldier is believed to be a prisoner of North Korea tonight after he fled to escape disciplinary action. One of our service members willfully and without authorization crossed the military demarcation line. According to reports, the soldier was being sent back to the U.S. after spending time in a South Korean jail. But when he was dropped off at Incheon Airport, he managed to mix in with some tourists who were on their way to the demilitarized zone. And once he got there, he made a run for it. And in London, a 28-year-old Canadian national is in custody tonight, suspected of being a member of a terrorist organization. He was arrested at Heathrow Airport on Monday afternoon, hours after a London man was arrested for the same reason. Neither man has been publicly named or charged. Today, police were granted warrants to hold them until Monday. In Toronto tonight, about 200 asylum seekers are sleeping indoors after two weeks living on the street. Today, the federal government announced one-time funding to help when newcomers can't find shelter. But Katie Nicholson shows us it was local groups who got this job done. As dawn breaks, asylum seekers wake up from what they hope is their last night on the streets. You, you must be aching. Does it, does it hurt? Yeah. 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 In the morning, you wake up, the ribs is full of pain. Fewer than a dozen remain outside this Toronto shelter, a fraction of what, for the last two weeks, was essentially a refugee camp in the heart of downtown. When I come here, it is not the country I expected. Tired of waiting for elected officials to act, a community coalition pulled together Monday night to bus nearly 200 asylum seekers to this church. We're just serving up breakfast right now. Their first breakfast served by the Jamaican Canadian Association. Initially we were told 30 people, then it got to 100, then 130. And when I wake up this morning at 5 o'clock, I saw a message from the pastor saying 200. We're doing it for as long as we can because we're not going to put them back on the street. But our hope is that our government and province will step up to do what is right by these people and restore human dignity. After days of intergovernmental tension. You can't just drop people and say, OK, we're, we're all done. It doesn't work that way. We need to work collaboratively all together. Now the feds have announced a one-time $212 million injection into an existing program that helps cover interim housing for asylum seekers. The lion's share, $97 million, earmarked for Toronto. We can continue in a predictable way to welcome significant numbers of refugees through our various programs, uh, but we do need uh, leadership to be demonstrated at the provincial and municipality, uh, municipal level as well. Toronto's mayor welcomed the money, but called it a short-term stopgap that will not meet the needs of refugees. For those hoping to escape the shelter crunch, a mix of resignation and trust. I don't know where I'm going to be taken, but I, I'm willing to go. And he hopes, wherever it is, it's better than this. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. After nearly 50 years of proclaiming their innocence, two Indigenous men have finally been acquitted of murder in Manitoba. I just uh, want to enjoy life. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, 
I won't forget it. I want to leave it behind. Well, you know, it's, I think it's too early to say what I feel. No, I gotta try to let it soak in for a while. Brian Anderson and Alan Woodhouse were convicted for the 1973 murder of a Winnipeg restaurant worker. Their appeals denied. Both spent years in prison before being paroled. Granting their acquittals today, the judge apologized for what he called a miscarriage of justice. Crews have cleared a blockade at a Winnipeg landfill. Anytime we can resolve things with the, in a peaceful manner and not have to go in with any show of force, uh, we definitely prefer that, that method. Protesters blocked access to the Brady Road landfill after the province refused to fund a search of another landfill for the remains of two Indigenous women. Police were on hand as the blockade was cleared. There were no arrests. In the middle of the busy summer travel season, a staffing shortage is causing flight delays at Canadian airports. But it's not airline workers, it's air traffic controllers. Kate McKenna shows us the impact. Matthew Gillis thought his life would look much different. But everything changed when his dream of becoming an air traffic controller was cut short. This was uh, a personal passion and I'd invested years into this pursuit. He was well into the rigorous training when NAV Canada, the corporation that oversees the country's air traffic controllers, cancelled the program and laid off staff because of the pandemic. But two years later, there's now a shortage of air traffic controllers and it's affecting passengers. We've seen a tremendous number of delays related to shortages of air traffic controllers. It's not clear exactly how many flights have been delayed this summer because of the shortage, but the group that represents Canada's airports says it's happening often. Those staffing shortages have impacted our air carrier flight schedules and airspace management from time to time in major regions of the country. Flying post-COVID has been a bumpy ride. Last year, the entire industry was hit by staffing issues. And of course, there's the unpredictable Canadian weather. We do certainly acknowledge the fact that we have had some staffing-related challenges. NAV Canada says it had to make difficult decisions during the pandemic. And the reality for that is we, didn't, we barely had any planes that were in the sky at the time. It was really at the lowest point. But it says it is only responsible for a small portion of flight delays in Canada. The federal transport minister says that's still too much. I am having regular conversation with the CEO of NAV Canada, including one this week, uh, to keep asking him for an update on the status of uh, their staffing operations. NAV Canada says there are more than 400 people in training and that most of the people who were laid off during the pandemic have come back. But training takes time, meaning this problem could persist. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. An Australian man is recovering tonight after a harrowing ordeal at sea. I'm alive and uh, I did, really didn't think I'd make it, you know. His dramatic rescue and how he survived months in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, next. Plus, the link between hearing loss and dementia. The problem is that hearing loss is invisible. How hearing aids could slow down the decline. And later, she did it once and then... She did it again. <laughs> the round of golf this Edmonton woman will never forget. We're back in two. Uh, I did really didn't think I'd make it, you know? So um, thank you, thank you so much. Australian sailor Timothy Shattuck and his dog Bella are both doing well tonight after more than two months drifting in the Pacific on a catamaran. They had set sail from Mexico on a 6,000-kilometer trek to French Polynesia. But one month in, a storm knocked out his electronics. He said he subsisted on just rainwater and raw fish and took pains to avoid the sun. Last week, they were spotted by a helicopter doing surveillance for a tuna trawler and by the slimmest of margins, they made it to safety. Look, to the captain and, and um, this, this fishing company that saved my life, I mean, um, what do you say? I'm I just so grateful. One survival expert said the sailor made it through a combination of luck and skill, and having Bella aboard may have made all the difference. Police in Nevada say they have carried out a search warrant in relation to the killing of Tupac Shakur. 
Tupac died in 1996 after he was the victim of a drive-by shooting in Las Vegas. No charges were laid and the case went cold. This new search was carried out about 30 kilometers away from the scene of the shooting. Investigators have not provided any additional information. Hearing loss has been strongly linked to cognitive decline, but a new study suggests hearing aids may help for those at risk of dementia. Paige Parsons explains the potential benefits for millions of Canadians. Hearing aids make things louder so that you can hear people better. Like but many older Canadians, 92-year-old Rosalind Hopp wasn't exactly excited about getting hearing aids. I listened to my daughter. I had to because I couldn't hear. I wanted to hear things. And that, to me, was very important. As I was but learning that hearing aids could help stave off dementia? I will take that any time. Research published in The Lancet found that a group of seniors identified as being at risk of developing dementia saw the rate of cognitive decline nearly cut in half over three years if they wore hearing aids. It's definitely more than we anticipated in a good way. It's not just improving your hearing. There are a lot of cascading effects, right, that we see now that it likely decreases loneliness and improves your social engagement, and become more active. Yeah, I didn't see the flesh trickle. Researchers say there are three suspected links between hearing loss and dementia. Failing hearing could overwhelm the brain and might speed up atrophy in the brain. Hearing loss can also lead to social isolation, which may affect cognition. The problem is that hearing loss is invisible. It's, it's one of the few truly invisible handicaps. It's very important. That this audiologist says screening for hearing loss should start at the age of 50. But hearing aids are expensive. In Canada, coverage and funding varies by province. There are many barriers to accessing hearing care. Cost is just one. But in fact, in some countries, like where I'm from in the UK, um, even though hearing aids are free in the national health, doesn't mean that everybody wears them. There's still this reluctance because of stigma and ageism into actually using them. So I'm just going to put the hearing aids back in. She hopes system. studies like this one will encourage governments to make hearing care more accessible for everyone. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. The pandemic brought about a change in people's attitudes towards work and a shift in the balance of power between workers and their bosses. People are saying they're just not going to accept status quo. We'll take a closer look at what some have called the great reshuffling and why it could be coming to an end. Plus, rethinking the role of Canada's national police force. Policing, national security, and then do boots on the ground policing. What does the future hold for the RCMP? The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. COVID did more than just empty out office towers in 2020. It also gave many workers an unexpected edge over employers, willing to bend on things like wages and remote work. Now, as things get back to some version of normal, that balance of power between workers and bosses could be shifting again. Here's Anya Zolajowski on where things stand. Starting at the height of the pandemic, workers found themselves able to dictate their working conditions by asking for more pay and more flexibility. But are those days creeping to an end? We're not seeing these intense uh, raises that we saw during the pandemic. A number of bosses say, retention is now up. Some will leave their jobs thinking that the grass is greener and, um, you know, sometimes grass is grass. Beginning in 2021, workers in the U.S. started leaving their jobs in droves. In America, 2021 has been the year of the great resignation. It's time to find something that is better for my family, something more stable. Employees at this Nebraska Burger King telling customers, we all quit. After you left, a bunch of your colleagues left too? Well, there was 23 of us and 20 of us quit. They said they wanted jobs with better conditions, including higher pay, better benefits, and flexibility, like room to work from home. Some economists say this signaled an optimistic shift for workers who wanted a fairer balance of power between them and their employers. Some people retired early, and we're still seeing signs of that now in the labor market statistics. So people that could retire um, and were burnt out working in either healthcare or education. A lot of them did, 
Some of them have come back. It was a trend we heard about here in Canada too, probably because it went viral on social media and made major international headlines. You're not outright quitting your job, but you're quitting the idea of going above and beyond. This is the TikTok video that sparked the conversation about quiet quitting. You're still performing your duties, but you're no longer subscribing to the hustle culture mentality that work has to be your life. Since COVID, the pandemic, working from home, I realized that I didn't like working 80 hours a week, sacrificing my mental health, emotional health, and physical health in the hope of getting a 5% pay raise at the end of the year. Economists are divided on whether Canada and even the US saw a mass exodus of workers. Some say a great reshuffling definitely happened, while others are cautious to use sweeping labels like the Great Resignation, even if it sounds catchy. That's largely because many workers didn't leave the workforce altogether. They just switched jobs. We've got fewer people entering the labor market and taking on better jobs. Uh, then we have people leaving the labor market because of aging. And that's a demographic story that's unfolding all over the global north. Today, we do know that a significant number of Canadian workers chose to change their jobs and move to industries that offered them a better deal. According to a survey published by ADP Canada, roughly a quarter of Canadian workers had switched jobs leading up to mid-2022. Most said they wanted higher pay. Another interesting data point is that employers across sectors were trying to fill nearly a million vacant positions in the second quarter of last year. That's the most vacant positions in a single quarter on record ever, according to Statistics Canada. That likely means workers felt they had room to be picky when it came to jobs, and employers, desperate to hire qualified candidates, had incentives to sweeten the deal with more pay, better benefits, and flexibility. But people are less confident when the economy isn't strong. This year, mass layoffs have hit industries like tech and media, and interest rate hikes are really starting to strain Canadian budgets. That can make it difficult to walk away from steady income, even if the job doesn't seem ideal. We don't know whether we're going to see um, a rise in unemployment, but what we have seen thus far has been very subdued. The people that have been hardest hit have been young people and recent immigrants that have lost their jobs. That's always the group that gets hit first. Are we at the end of a great reshuffling? And are workers losing the little bit of power they seemed to gain two years ago? Workers versus bosses. Who's got the power these days? Jennifer Moss is a Canadian workplace strategist and author of The Burnout Epidemic. Jennifer, thanks for coming into the studio. I'm so glad to be here. It's great. Uh, when we talk about workforces, it's obviously diverse, you know, banking, tech, retail, farming, construction, uh, rural, you know, what, what sort of broad strokes have we seen in Canada? You know, it's been really interesting because I really believe that the sort of the length of the pandemic, the enduring part of it, the fact that we were facing our mortality, this collective experience, what it did is it just touched every part of the workforce. There was no sector kind of untouched by this experience. We changed patterns and habits. Everything was so rapid. And that sort of evolved across the entire you know, workforce. Every sector was going through these uh, high levels of burnout, massive shifts in the hours that people were working. We were working 30% more each day to hit those same pre-COVID goals. That led to kind of everyone having this experience um, of, of challenge in the last couple of years. And from you know what I've heard, there were people who felt empowered or maybe just felt that they needed to ask for some things like uh, fewer hours or maybe just leaving their job and going to a different job. But as the economy cools, as we hear about fears of recession, do you think workers have less freedom now, less power when it comes to you know, demanding more things? When you face your collective mortality as an entire global workforce, everything changes. And so the behavioral economics have changed and what we're expecting and demanding and requiring as individual employees is, is a interesting uh, dynamic right now between what employers want to provide because everyone wants to get back to this new normal. They want to jam the toothpaste back in the tube and we can't do that. And, and I think that's what is the big shift right now, that experience of, of um, trying to move into this new you know, environment that's totally different. And people are saying they're just not going to accept status quo. 
There was a time when younger workers would come into the workforce, I can tell you firsthand, and just thought, I want to fit in. I'm not going to ask many questions. I'll just do what I'm told. And then I get a sense now that, that maybe that is shifting, that younger workers have kind of are, are willing to, to speak up and, and have greater demands, and, and they express it in lots of ways. So let's, let's cue some TikTok videos. This is your sign to keep rage applying to jobs. Hey, I'm gonna need you to come back early from your break. It's crazy. I'm actually applying to jobs right now. I'm super busy. What? Why? Because I'm miserable. <laughs> Mainly because of you. You're the worst. What, you're interviewing elsewhere? Oh, hold on, sorry, I've got to take this. Hello? Yeah, I can speak. Yeah, so I'm just looking to get out of my current job. It's just a bit of a toxic environment here. Okay, so cool videos, but does that reflect at all what, what's happening in the workplace? It's essentially an amplification of employee dissatisfaction, but done on this massive scale. I mean, you're looking at a billion people picketing, essentially, when you have this, you know, uh, amount of attention that's just on this social media space. And so you can't ignore it. We can't look at this as just a pesky generation over, you know, speaking, over sharing. They're actually really making some changes, and it's creating this codification of laws and policy that we've never seen before. Okay, so you do work with some big companies. Are they changing their expectations of workers? We're seeing tons of change, and I think that's what's really important is that this is a win-win. So many of these competitive organizations are saying, I'm going to listen to this group who want just basic needs. They want you know, work-life harmony, and they want balance, and, and that's a good thing because it'll lead to be more, you know, being more competitive and more successful for these organizations overall. All right, Jennifer Moss, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Coming up, questions about the future of the RCMP and what role it will play in communities across the country. The culture hasn't changed. The structure, of course, hasn't changed. The systems haven't changed. Why some say Canada's national police force needs to evolve. The head of Canada's National Police Union today called on the federal government to provide clarity about the future role of the Mounties. Our members are not pawns. They are people. They deserve respect and certainty in their future. Ottawa is currently reviewing the RCMP's contract with provinces. They're not up for renewal until 2032. But some are questioning the Mounties' value and looking for reforms. Some communities are considering replacing the RCMP altogether. Last month, Catherine Tunney traveled to Surrey, British Columbia. This is the fleet for Canada's newest police force. Decked out and ready to go. But when a 911 call comes in, these cars can't respond. So we're in this dilemma. Somebody's gotta be in charge one police of jurisdiction and that's the RCMP so they are in charge and we work for them if you will. It's Chief Norm Lipinski's job to sell the Surrey Police Service to replace the Mounties. We will never win everybody over but I do believe that we we bring some goodness to this city and uh, we won't let the city down. Letting people down is exactly what the Mounties did in port au -Pic, Nova Scotia in 2020. Systemic failures, poor communications, and a lack of local knowledge played a role in the country's worst mass shooting. This year, an inquiry exposed the challenges of a police force spread too thin, a single organization responsible for everything, from traffic to terrorism. It's why Lipinski believes Surrey deserves a police force just for Surrey. I do believe it's time to have a second look. Can they do federal policing, national security, and then do boots on the ground policing? Should the Mounties police both urban cities and rural towns? Could they focus solely on federal crimes like the FBI? They're questions for the top Mountie in BC. I think those discussions are healthy. I think we as an organization need to learn from and evolve as a result of those discussions to make ourselves better. Dwayne McDonald argues the RCMP's model is what makes it so valuable. 
the knowledge, skills, and expertise that we are able to bring to any one public safety issue, whether small in a rural area or internationally, I think that's something that we shouldn't shy away from, but that we should celebrate. Surrey isn't the only place questioning the value of the RCMP. The force has been plagued by a sexual assault scandal, called out for systemic racism, and most recently, the mass shooting in Nova Scotia exposed fundamental flaws with the RCMP. It has some observers wondering if the force is even capable of change. So maybe tell me a bit about the woman in this photo. Well, that is me. Karen Adams knows what it's like to push for change from inside the force. She was one of the first women ever to wear an RCMP uniform yeah. in 1974. Yes. But still we had shoes that looked like a granny and had heels on them. Not really functional at all, but uh, some gals have stories about chasing people and falling. Fighting to be on the same footing as the men. I looked in the mirror, put my Stetson on and literally cried and saying it took 16 years for me to be deemed an equal. Oh yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking. Sexually assaulted by a superior, she was taught to bury it. He was a corporal, and we learned in training that corporals were like mini-gods. You just did what they told you to do, and you didn't question it, and uh, you got on with your day. Adams believes reform is necessary to fix the toxic culture. I think it, the organization has become too large, too cumbersome to deal with all the situations it's dealing with. Change management was Eli Sopo's job at the RCMP, but he saw little willingness for it. The culture hasn't changed. The structure, of course, hasn't changed. The systems haven't changed. When you talk about change, you know, we talk about a sense of urgency and a sense of purpose. Well, it seems to have no sense of urgency at the political level. He says the stakes are too high to ignore this conversation. I guarantee you, you will have another major disaster severe injuries, death, and complete chaos because of poor communications, poor issues management, poor leadership and structures. Those shoes and the clutch purse, yeah, yeah let's I know be honest, not people functional. People clearly felt different yeah. um, at the time. The force says it's owning up to its faults and not just with the uniforms. We're more than willing to change and I think we're, like, we're really well positioned to succeed in the future and continue to serve the country. How is now a question for cities, provinces, and the federal government, possibly changing the iconic Canadian symbol forever. The CBC's Catherine Tunney. BC may be the first province to address that question on Wednesday. It will decide whether the city of Surrey can abandon its transition to a city police force and continue with the RCMP. My friend had actually made a joke right before I hit, being like, what are the odds that you get a hole in one? The shot of a lifetime times two. That's coming up in our moment. <laughs> it is every golfer's dream to make a hole in one at least once in their lifetime. But last week, Taylor Ma from Edmonton did it twice in the same round. The feat is so rare, it's only been accomplished three times at the professional level. So tonight, Taylor Ma's precise aim is our moment. My friend had actually made a joke right before I hit, being like, what are the odds that you get a hole in one? The right. odds are literally 67 million to one to get two. Are you f kidding me? So the first one was the second par three on the front nine of this course. So I just walked up and I hit it. And I guess he just had a feeling that I was gonna, like something was gonna happen. So he whipped out his phone and that's how he got the first one on camera. Are you f kidding me? Wait, this is my first Everybody keeps telling me our celebration on video was kind of underwhelming, but we were all just like in shock. Yeah, there's Josh. So the second one was actually only like three holes later. This one was a little bit further away, so I was like, did I see that right? And they were like, did it go in? Like, where's your ball? And I'm like, I think it's in the hole. <laughs> You're f joking. That's insane. Two. But yeah, I guess it's probably the coolest thing I've done. So the beauty of the internet is a moment like that can be shared around the world. There's another part to the internet and some people have been saying that was faked, didn't really happen. But they would like to point out that there were people playing behind them who saw both of the holes in one and cheered along with them. It was real. 
That is the National for July 18th. I'll see you tomorrow night.